chapter 17 is his, is his last prayer with his disciples. His Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And let's see, I guess it was about this time ten years ago, I woke up and started praying. And my heart was given in this song. Because I, I like Paul Wilbur in that last song. It's exactly the way I felt. about taking us to where he is. This being the eighth day of the fall feast season, I looked up the number eight 
Number eight is for new beginnings. It's uh, Shimone in the Hebrew. It's the eight is the number of the value of the letter Ket. Okay, and it means to separate or an inner room. And studying this year, we've come up, in fact, a couple of months ago, I was awakened in the night, and some scriptures came to mind that just fell into place, and all of a sudden I found out it was this message. In every case when something has been cleansed in scripture, it was done for seven days. Then on the eighth day, it was clean and presented to the priest at the temple. For example, the temple was built in seven years and dedicated in the eighth year, the beginning of the eighth year. Messiah, when he was born, was dedicate, dedicated on the eighth day. Circumcised on the eighth day, I mean circumcised. The priesthood, when they are assigned, they are set apart for seven days and on the eighth day, they're clean and pronounced clean to serve Yahweh. In fact, Leviticus 8, the whole chapter there, is Yahweh's instructions to take for Moses to take Aaron and his sons and the anointing oil and the bullock and the rams and the basket of unleavened bread and go through the whole procedure. And verse 34 says, As hath he done this day, so Yahweh hath commanded to do to make an atonement for you. Therefore ye shall abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of Yahweh that ye die not, for I am commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things which Yahweh commanded by the hand of Moses. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And they went through the whole procedure and... Uh, uh, did the offerings and the sprinkling of the blood and everything. And then verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of Yahweh appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before Yahweh and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. Which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. A phenomenal day. In the scriptures, whenever um, a person touched a dead body, they were considered unclean. They had to wait seven days. And they mikvah washed their bodies, you know, with the mikvah, the baptism, and cleansed themselves, presented them to the, made an offering at the temple, and they were clean on the eighth day. Those with leprosy. The same thing. Those with bodily discharges had to wait seven days. And anybody who went to the to the had leprosy, they would they would make an offering and tell the priest and they would make them wait seven days. And on the eighth day, if they showed no sign of the leprosy, they were uh, pronounced clean. Well, let's look at Ezekiel 43:25. It says, seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering, and you shall prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shall they purge the altar and purify it, and shall consecrate themselves. And when these days are expired, it shall be upon the eighth day, and so forward. The priest shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you. This was the cleansing of the, of the altar. They gave a peace offering on the eighth day. Feast of Tabernacles. Seven days. They had uh, a set of offerings every day for the nations. And on the eighth day, it was a different set of offerings because that was the day representing the cleansing. Let's look at Revelations 21.3. And it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And Yahweh himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. This is what the whole feast is talking about. Yahweh with us. 
at the actually the picture is the wedding feast of Yeshua with his bride for the whole feast of tabernacles and then the eighth day is the picture of Yeshua and his bride in going into their new home the holy city the heavenly Jerusalem didn't know that till just recently okay think about this now the jubilee cycle remember the jubilee cycle it was a uh, seven sets of seven years. It's like the Jubilee cycle that's shown in, in uh, uh, the time between Pentecost or uh, Passover and Pentecost. Seven sets of seven weeks. Finalized on that 50th day. The day after the seven weeks uh, is Pentecost. And of course the Jubilee cycle with the Jubilee years is the same way. Seven sets of seven years followed by the Jubilee, Jubilee year of release and freedom and new beginnings. That's what the number eight stands for, new beginnings. All the holy days and all the appointed times are sh basically shadow pictures. And they're in preparation for the eighth day. And it's a shadow picture of the greatest day in all of history when Yahweh will dwell with his family, all of it, with his children, here on earth with men, his created human sons and daughters. We always talk about our, the greatest thing happening is the day that Yeshua returns. But there's a greater day, and that's the day when Yahweh returns to all of us. Not just Yeshua and the family, or the kids, or everybody else. But anyway, let's look at uh, Revelations 22.5. It says, there shall be no night there, they need no need of candle, neither light of the sun, for Yahweh Elohim giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Who's they? Yeshua and Yahweh, and all their children. Okay? Forever. There were six days of man with Satan, one day without Satan to clean up the mess, and the eighth day to hand over the world to the Father. And that's real rest. And uh, can you imagine the joy and the new jobs involved there? Well, Satan has had six days of counterfeiting involving man trying to counterfeit the, the works of Yahweh. He's changed the seventh day Sabbath to the eighth day or the Sunday. He's changed the, uh, well, they, they're even uh, they're talking about the eighth resurrection of the Roman Empire. Let's look at Daniel 7.25. And, of course, the leaders of the nations, there's one that's going to speak great words against the Most High, and he will wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Talking about the Antichrist. The world system wants to change everything. They want to counter counterfeit everything that Yahweh has set up. They want to change his times, his appointed times. They want to change his days of worship, his set-apart days. And uh, let's see. Let's look at Isaiah 9. Okay. Okay, I've got them marked here. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty Yahweh, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. And Luke 1, 32 and 33. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord and Yahweh... Uh, Adonai shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. One thing that I, I, I forget, forgot to say this feast, and I like to remind everybody, that every word that Yeshua said in the 
in the New Testament was a requote of something from the Old Testament, from Psalms, from Isaiah, from Exodus, or something he said himself, you know, previously in his, in his appearance to Moses and Abraham and everybody else. Everything in the New Testament is just a repeat or a an uh, amplification of what was said in the Old Testament, okay? So people try to say, you know, the Church of Christ people come and say, oh, the Old Testament doesn't mean anything. It's done away. It's the basis for everything in the New Testament. Okay. Well, let's look at Revelations 21.1. Twenty-one one says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Okay. So we got a new heaven and a new earth. A new set of, uh, a new beginning, a new, a new background to do everything with. Do you think that uh, any of the uh, regulations or the instructions of Yahweh are going to be done away at that time? I doubt it. Let's look at Genesis 17.10 because we need to look at that. Yeshua experienced this particular teaching and most of us have experienced this teaching and it's about circumcision. Genesis 17.10-14 And this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money or any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Well, the whole scientific reason they found out that circumcision is needed is that the vitamin K levels in the newborn child is the highest after eight days. It's actually above 100%. It's more than he needs for that particular day so that the healing will take place as quick as possible. The body is prepared for cutting by the circumcision. Are you prepared for cutting? Yahweh has going to have to do a lot of cutting on all of us. And this is what Paul is talking about in the New Testament when he talks about circumcision. Let's look at Romans 2, 28 and 29. Romans 2. For he is not a Jew, or it should be here, he is not an Israelite, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is an Israelite which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. So he's talking about cutting out parts of our heart, parts that don't work right, okay? Or parts that aren't, are meant to be done away with to bring us into covenant with the Father. How about first fruits or firstborns? Is that going to change in the millennium? Is that going to change after the millennium? Exodus 22, 29. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors. The firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. And let's follow that up with Leviticus 22. And I don't, I've got these marks, so you don't have to try to keep up with me. <laughs> Leviticus 22, 26, and 27 says, And Yahweh said to Moses, When a bullock or a sheep or a goat is brought forth, is born, then it shall be seven days under the mother, and from the eighth day and thenceforth it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. The mother would keep it for seven days, and then they would make it an offering on the eighth day, from the eighth day and beyond. Seven days preparation and cleaning and the eighth day they give it to him give it to the to the father well purifying the altar we read that a while ago a little bit about that in Ezekiel let's look at that again Ezekiel 43 
Yeah, okay, here we go. Ezekiel 43, 7 to 12. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Did you ever read that before? He said to me, The place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings nor their carcasses of the kings in the high places. He's talking about that in Ezekiel. What were, we ta what were we singing about a while ago? Being in his presence because he's going to be here with us. Eight, verse 8. In the setting of their threshold by my thresholds and their post by my post and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations, what they have committed. Wherefore I have consumed them in mine anger. Now let them put away their whoredoms and their carcasses of their kings far from me. I will dwell in the midst of them forever. I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof. Write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. This is the law of the house. Did you ever hear of the law of the house? Right here he says it. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountains, the whole limit thereof, round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. The law of the house. His law, his Torah, is going to be forever. It's going to be in the millennium. It's going to be after the millennium in the holy city. It's going to be throughout eternity. And during uh, this, this particular chapter of Ezekiel, he's doing the layout of the altars, what he's teaching here. In verses 25 to 27, where we read a while ago, um, talk about the seven days you prepare every day for a goat. And then on the eighth day, they, do, they made the burnt offering. The peace offering. And with the peace office, he say, offering, he says, I will accept you. And in preparing the priesthood in Leviticus 8, he goes through the rituals of, of consecration and it says, on the eighth day, they were qualified. He cleansed the temple. On seven days it took to cleanse it. On the eighth day it was clean. The Nazarite vow. Did you ever read about that in Numbers? Let's go to Numbers 6. 1 to 10. Number 6, 1 to 10. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, When either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto Yahweh, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, shall drink no vinegar or wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes or eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall be no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separateth himself unto Yahweh. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair and his head grow. All the days that he separates himself, he shall come at no dead body. He's not to touch a dead body during his Nazarite vow. He shall not make himself unclean for his father and for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, not even touch them. Because the consecration of his Elohim is on his head. All the days of his separation he is holy unto Yahweh. And if any man die suddenly by him and he hath defiled the head of his concentration by accidentally touching him or whatever, he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles, turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make atonement for him for that he sinned by touching the dead body or had, was in, polluted by the death. And he shall hollow, hollow or make holy his head that same day. 
And he shall consecrate unto Yahweh the days of his separation, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost, because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto Yahweh, and so forth. But anyway, I never noticed that before, that the tied to the Nazarite vow was if he accidentally touched a dead person, he had to be cleansed for seven days, and on the eighth day, he was cleansed of that. And the lepers, the same way, lepers and, and discharges from the body. Well, let's talk about another aspect here. I mentioned that the eighth day represents, uh, or uh, um, Shemini Atzeret represents a new beginning, a new home, a new home for the bridegroom after the millennial wedding. And actually, uh, in the Jewish or Is Israelite wedding, the bridegroom and the bride celebrate their wedding. Then they move into their new house. And then they spend the rest of their lives raising their family properly. Okay? Now let's look at Revelation 21, 1 to 27. Because this is, this is where we're at. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Do we need a new earth? Yes. We've messed it up terribly. Satan and his minions have, have caused it to be that way and just ruined it. And I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from Yahweh out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Prepared as a bride for her husband actually prepared for the bride and the husband. Okay? Not just as the bride and the husband, but prepared for the bride and her husband. Yeshua and all the, the children who become the bride. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Yahweh himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. And I was surprised how many times in the Old Testament that is spoken over and over in Ezekiel and Isaiah and all the way back. And Yahweh shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He, and he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of water freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. All things. Wow. The entire universe? Guess what I heard this morning and I learned. In the universe, scientists now think. Oh, where have I got that written down here? Let me see. I got it written down. They think that there's more than 10,000 billion trillion stars out there with planets attached all around. 10,000 million or billion trillion stars. That's 25 zeros. Okay? And the thing about that is it's continually moving and growing. There's more being added to it all the time. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And it goes through and, and talks about the gates of the city and how large it is. And of course, the city itself is going to be unique of anything else on earth. You know, the land that was promised to Abraham, how far was it? From the Euphrates to the Nile and north and south and everywhere that Israel stepped their foot. Now, during their journeys in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Arabia, during the 40 years, they stepped on almost every, every area of that whole peninsula, all the way down to Yemen. 
and their footprints are still available to see today because they marked them and they wrote them in paint or whitewash or whatever on stones all over that area. Well, anyway, if you go 1,500, 750 miles south and north of Jerusalem and east and west of Jerusalem, that's 1,500 miles square. That's where the new Jerusalem is going to sit. 1,500 miles in each direction. And of course, there's, there's nobody can agree on whether it's a cube or a pyramid, but still, the base is 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles and 1,500 miles up. That's a long ways. That's a lot of territory. But remember the back in the Garden of Eden when Yahweh walked with man in the garden? Now, we don't know how big the garden was either. We think it's, you know, a few miles, maybe pretty small. But that was actually a portal between the celestial dimension, the timeless dimension of heaven and the time dimension of earth. And he had to put angels at the edge of it when he kicked Adam and Eve out so that nobody would go back in and have access to the tree of life. And of course, after the, once the flood changed the surface of the earth and covered that all up or whatever, he closed that dimension. Well, that dimension is going to be back, opened back up again for that holy city to come and sit on the earth. And you read in there about us, we just got through reading a while ago, about going in and coming out of the presence of Yahweh. In and out of the city. In and out of the city. In and out of that timeless dimension out into the time dimension that we know today as, you know, uh, live uh, length, width, breadth, height, and time. Yahweh is in a dimension that has no time. That's the reason he can be before everything and after everything. And he can know things before they happen and, and uh, give all this prophecy to us ahead of time. It said, And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine on it, for the glory of Yahweh did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So the light of the Lamb is the same as the, as the glory of Yahweh. Because they're one and the same. He says they're one. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither anything that works abomination or maketh a lie, but only they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Because no sin can exist in the presence of the Father. No sin can be in, in the presence. So everything has to stay outside. That's unclean. And only those who are... Well, it says here. Only they which are written, written in the Lamb's book of life can walk into that city. And be a part of that. And be in the presence of the Father. When you're at home, who do you like to have around you? How do you like, who do you like to have with you? Your children. Father seems the same way. He wants all his children around him. Especially ones that are ones that are in tune with him. He doesn't want those, the ones that are rebellious. They're causing trouble and making accusations and... and pitching fits, you know, and just being children. He wants them to be grown-up children. He wants them to be loving children, caring children, caring about each other. He wants peace because his house is a house of peace. Is a house of peace. We are all waiting for Yeshua. Then will we be waiting for Yahweh? Let's look at John 7 and 8. Because I'm just now getting to the to the sermon part of this. <laughs> All that was to show you that we've had, we have seven days of cleansing and preparation so that we can enjoy the eighth day where the limits are limitless. John 7, Yeshua had been teaching on the last day of the feast and talking about, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit there. And of course, how many people understood what he was saying right then? Well, he spent his time trying, well not trying, but actually laying out the plan and showing people what, what was going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he, they went home that day and they went back the next morning. 
after the last day of the feast, the next morning, as in chapter 8, it says, And early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they set her in the middle of them, he, they said to him, Woman, or Master, this woman was taken in the adultery in the very act. And now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? See, they were trying to trap him. They were trying to trap him. They said this, tempting him that he might have, that they might have something to accuse him about. But Yeshua stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he didn't even hear them. And when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And he stooped down and wrote on the ground again. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the oldest, even to the last. And Yeshua was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Yeshua had lifted himself up, he saw none but the woman. And he said, Woman, where are your accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she says, No man. And Yeshua said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. Okay. What was taking place here? See, Torah says to kill those involved in adultery by stoning if there's two or three witnesses. Okay, only then. And then they are to, th the ones who saw the act take place are the ones who are supposed to throw the first stones and then the rest of the congregation would throw the stones. Why did Yeshua write in the dust? We don't know what he wrote. But let me give you a, a couple of insights into the dust. The dust of the temple. Whenever a man accused his wife of being unfaithful, he took her to the temple and the priest would take the dust off the floor and mix water with it and make the lady drink it. And if she blowed it up, she was guilty. And if she didn't blow it up, she was innocent. That was a test. That was a trial by dust. Okay? Uh, it was a very, very severe thing. But anyway, Yeshua's writing in the dust down there saying, you guys know about dust? Do you know what happens with dust? And maybe he even wrote maybe their name, one of their names down there, or two of their names down there, or something that they had done. Because he, he asked them, which one of you is guiltless? Which one of you has not done anything that was sinful? If, if you're the one that's, not, that's sinless, go ahead and throw a stone. You know, And of course, nobody could stand up to that. Plus, see, they had sinned already anyway. They didn't break them, bring the man with them. They were supposed to have brought the man according to the law. They were supposed to bring the man there for the accusation too. So they had broke the law. Yeshua had not broken it at all. And he was clearly free to tell her to go because she had no accusers and she didn't have her partner there. And, but he did give her that stipulation. Go and sin no more. And in this situation, by law, Yeshua could not re pronounce a death sentence on this lady because they, uh, the accusers had left and you know, all he could do was tell her what to do from that point on. He instructed her to eliminate later problems. To go and sin no more. Well, why did this teaching occur on the eighth day of the fall festival season? The day of new beginnings, the day beyond time. And there's a Hebrew idiom that indicates that this day was also called the day beyond time. Because technically, our presence and our dealings with Yahweh is in time up until that day. Once, and then once that holy city is there, then we have access to that timeless dimension. And his orders and the universe from that point on. The eighth day is a day of a fresh start, a fresh start in a sinless state. We've lived through the seven days and the, uh, actually 7,000 years in our case, waiting for 
the cleansing and the sacrifice. We've gone through cleansing. We've been brought through our understand, given the understanding of what sin is. We've learned the Torah. Our sac the sacrifice has been made for us by Messiah, by Yeshua. And now, Yeshua, having been sacrificed to us, is going to change us into spirit. Those of us who are taking part in the first resurrection. And then those of us who will take, who are going to be cleansed in the second resurrection. And his sacrifice is good for all future eternity. But we are still reminded to go and sin no more. Since now, we can actually do it. Well, from the time of, like I say, the, the arrival after the great white throne judgment when the new Jerusalem arrives and when we become spirit beings or if we be, even if we become spirit beings ahead of time. We can actually do that command. We can go and sin no more because we can actually do it perfectly because we've been changed to spirit with Yeshua's spirit in us and our experience and knowledge of Torah and our repentance and acceptance by the Father. We can actually do it. We can go and sin no more. We can't do that until we become spirit beings and children of the Father in the same style that Yeshua was resurrected. And the fact that our accuser is no longer around to accuse us makes it even more possible for us to go and sin no more. Satan's locked up and put away and then becomes a crispy critter in Gehenna. With Satan gone, it's easier for us to go and sin no more. We've got nobody tempting us and working on us all the time. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 18 to 21. Ephesians 1. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory of the inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who, are, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Messiah when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the Olam Haba, represented by Shemini Atzeret the world to come, the universe that is coming. Okay, John 10, 28. That's pretty close here. We can find that. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Why shall no man pluck them out of their hand? Why shall they never perish? Because they're going out and sinning no more for all eternity. Okay? We will finally be free to reach our eternal destiny, to live as children of Yahweh, to fulfill our potential, to gain the fathomless knowledge and abilities to do all that the Father needs for us to do. He's got jobs for us to do all throughout the expanse of the universe. All throughout the 10,000 billion trillion stars and all those planets. They weren't sitting out there empty for a reason. And the universe keeps expanding because he keeps creating. And we know it. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. All creation and all time endlessly. Unmaximizable. Our job is unmaximizable. Creating and growing. That, that potential for the growth is, is unre, unmaximizable. While we're going and sinning no more, our potential is limitless because Yahweh our Father has said, we have been given all things. I love Toy Story. Y'all see ever see Toy Story, the, the, cart, the movie? And the, the hero of Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear. His famous saying, what was it? Infinity and beyond. Infinity and beyond. <laughs> they didn't know what they were saying. Infinity and beyond. Now, infinity means in world or you know endless time, endless time. But see, Yahweh says we can do more than that because we can go beyond time, throughout time, into His time, timeless dimension. Go anywhere and everywhere He wants us to go. Do everything and anything He wants us to do because. We go and sin no more. Okay. 
So brethren, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this and I've been fascinating putting this together and I love being here with you guys. Like I say, you're, you're like our family. We can't... When we finally uh, saw that the only feast site listed in the whole internet on the right day was this one, I said, praise y'all, we're going here. <laughs> I don't know how, how so many people can get so mixed up. If, if, if Jerusalem is our home and the center of the universe and the center of all our teaching and the law is going to come up from Jerusalem, how can you count your sighting of the moon from Arizona or Hawaii or Australia? We're supposed to be getting orders from headquarters. That's the reason we're here. We're here to obey Yahweh, to practice observing his feasts, to practice going and sinning no more, so that we can eventually get to that spot when Yeshua returns, that we can have the ability to go and sin no more. <laughs>